Hello, everybody. We are agents from Bell Castro Literary Agency, and today we're going to be answering questions that all of you left us on Twitter. We're going to be focusing on most of the questions that were for a broader audience instead of specific targeted works of your own. So if we miss anything or if you guys have something that you're really wanting to know, go ahead and leave it in the comments. We are either going to answer them in the comments themselves or we will address it in our next episode. Um, and right now we are going to introduce ourselves and get the ball rolling. So Ella. Hi, I'm Ella Marie Shoup, an agent with Bell Castro Agency, and I handle adult titles and I really love mystery, suspense, thriller, think, Bruce Ware, Catherine Stedman, uh, Kate Morton, historical. Um, everything can be found on BalcastroAgency.com. You can see my wish list, everybody's wish list, and also where to submit your query. We use Query Manager. Sharon? Hi, I'm Sharon Belcastro. Um, I do YA, all genres of YA. Um, I particularly like Dark. Lainey Taylor is one of my favorite authors, um, along with Minnie McGinnis um, and um, Jason Reynolds and anything YA um, that's dark and mysterious. I, I particularly love, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking out, blanking out here tonight, uh, magical realism. Okay, is it my turn? Okay. I keep I keep I keep going on delay and it's like totally throwing me off. Okay. Go ahead, Courtney. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> okay so I'm Courtney. Um I represent why <laughs> an adult. Um I also really like the darker, grittier stuff. Um I tend to like more stuff that deals with like trauma and like mental health. Anything LGBTQ um, I want in my box, um, all the queer stories, please. Um, and yeah, anything that you can comp to like Lee Bardugo or like Saw Kill Girls or like anything like that, I want it. Especially if you could send me horror, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> and I'm Caitlin Johnson. I do middle grade YA and adult. And um, a lot like Courtney, I really want more things with LGBT and mental health advocacy and disability rep. Um, I lean toward the dark stuff, but I'm loving, loving finding a lot of, you know, the lighter rom-com stuff like that. Literally just don't, I don't do nonfiction unless it's graphic novel and I don't do like thriller or suspense and horror only in middle grade, but send me all your historical, send me all of your, you know, female, female, trans, all of that kind of stuff. Just, you know, look up our profiles and just see what we click with. Ella, you can go over uh, what we'll be starting with tonight. Okay, we're going to go over queries. So we're going to work from the top to the bottom and try to give you all the information on how you should query when you're querying any agent, not just us. And we'll get into a little bit of specifics of, of what we like. And I'll start it off by saying before you query, have your manuscript finalized, uh, completed, and also, you should think it's top notch. It's edited. It's ready to go. It's a, it's in the best possible shape. Um, and it should also be um, within word count guidelines. Um, and we've talked about that before. So for your genre, you know, do your research. Um, see how many uh, words you should be at. Don't send something that's twenty thousand under or over. Um, and then when you submit, there's definitely a format um, to a query letter. And the top should be your title, your genre, and the word count. Now, at Belcastro Agency, we use Query Manager. So that's going to ask you for that right off the bat. But if you are just sending an email, make sure that's right at the top because that's what the agent wants to see first. Um, and then once you go on um, beyond that, anyone else want to chime in? Then you're going to go right into your query. And your query is different than your synopsis. And <laughs> don't, get me, don't get me started on that. That's yeah. what we're going to talk about. Um, we did have some questions on basically 
um, how to structure that query. So Shannon or Courtney, do you guys have specific tidbits that you think make the best structure, what you like to see in a query going forward? Yeah, I can feel that. I like to see um, who the character is, what their greatest desire is, um, what stands in their way, and what's at stake if they fail in achieving their goals or desires. Sorry, your delay just makes me laugh every now and then. <laughs> I know, I keep delaying. I don't know what's going on. This is how we live, y'all. So. Sorry, we're not professionals at this. <laughs> and also, um, one thing I, I forgot before you send um, the query, make sure it is what we are looking for. Um, you don't want to waste your time because, you know, don't, don't send me, for instance, a picture book because I don't do them. So make sure you really research the agents and what they're looking for before you send it out. And adding on to that, we use Query Manager, which means all of our genres and age categories that we represent are in there. I see so many middle grade that like are masquerading as YA in my box and I don't represent middle grade. So I promise you, like we don't have things hiding. If we don't represent it, it's not going to be an option for you to pick. Like just, just so you know. Yes, we had a little technical difficulty there. I don't know what got caught and what didn't. So to sum that up, in case you just see a black screen during that, because <laughs> um, all of a sudden things just started loading for me. I was like, what just happened to the stream? Um, basically, go look at the submission guidelines. If it's not listed, we don't take it. End of story. That's to sum that part up. <laughs> this is a very interesting night for filming. Um, so yeah, basically what Sharon said, like. <laughs> Try to do, you know, the three paragraph format with your pitch. I always tell people, you know, that first paragraph's your metadata, do your title, your intro, your word count, genre, all that fun stuff. Then do your character, then do your conflict, then do the consequences, like the stakes, what's at risk, um, and then your bio, and then you're good. Um, as long as we get those main bits, we're pretty happy after that. Um, who wants to feel possibly getting, well, somebody asked to, <laughs> who wants to go, go. Somebody asked you about comparable. I was going to say somebody asked you about comparable titles and I think they're very important, um, because we need to go to editors with comparables ourselves to let them know what kind of market this book, um, fits into and what kind of authors it's similar to so they can get a feel for how big the audience is when they pitch it to their team. Yes, and as far as the actual uh, query, um, you don't want to go over a page. So for the query itself should be about 200 words and your author bio maybe around 50, give or take a few words. And that's the time to wow us. So that is the time that you can have a cliffhanger that is the time where you can't, you want to make us read the next thing, which would be the synopsis and your first pages. So that's the time we're laying out, you know, the character or the plot. You also want to get your tone in there. So especially for me, because I really love the suspense and thriller, I want to see the proper tone for that. Um, it's not a time to, to use your humor, even if, you know, you've got the humor. But the query should be in the tone of the manuscript. Um, so that's another pointer there to, to think about when you're writing that. But yeah. do not tell it in the voice of the character. Oh, yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. You're not, <laughs> you're not writing this letter that says, my name is George, and you know, my day started out almost getting hit by a bus. Like, that's not okay. what we're going for. We're going for it's a professional letter where you are like, so and so started out his day doing so. And I mean, obviously, don't use that because that's a step by step thing, but you get what I mean. Um, you want to make it an actual pitch. I always say think of it as like a teaser trailer to a movie. We're getting some cool, the, the main core of the story, what's going to draw us in, but you're not giving us a play by play of like everything that's happening. Right. Um, I wanted to add too, just with comparison titles that Sharon mentioned. Um, so like she said, they're super important and like you should absolutely do your research and dig as hard as you can for them. But 
no comparison titles are better than really, really bad comparison titles. So like if you're if you want to use like Harry Potter, like as your comparison title, which I don't suggest doing. Um, and then, you know, we read the queer and we read the pages. And the only thing that's the same is that they have wizards, but like in completely different contexts. You're going to be like, wait, what? That's not what I expected, like going in. Um, and so like you want good comparison titles. But if you kind of only have one that's either like really, really big or something that's only really loosely like tied, like, yeah, just make sure you have really you have like good solid ones if you're going to have comparison titles. And make sure they're not really old. You can switch it up. You can have books along with like a movie or a video game. But you want to try to keep things that are a little more relevant. If you have a really old title, say like Lord of the Flies. Tell us what about it from Lord of the Flies matches yours and then give us something more contemporary to pair with it so we can see, ooh, you're bringing this old to this new and putting it together. We like those, but it's better if you don't have an idea of what you're actually comparing to, don't put them at all. I like them. Me personally, I don't, I don't care about compared to five that much. I know we're going to brainstorm about them because editors do like them. But as the query letter themselves, for me, I'm not going to reject you based off your I think we also had a question around, can you use movies as comparables? Um, and yes, absolutely you can. We just sold a um, title that used Friday Night Lights as one of the comparables. So if you have a movie um, that is very close to your title, please go ahead and use it. Um, with like what Caitlin just said too, though, like if you're going to use a movie, like I wouldn't pair like a movie and a TV show or like a movie and a movie. I would definitely try if you're going to use a movie or a TV show or another form of media, pair it with a book so that we still know that you're reading in your genre. Exactly. We want to know. It, it does help a lot to do something like the voice of this author. You don't have to give a book necessarily sometimes. Um, and if you're going for those big blockbuster books, like she said with Harry Potter, say what about that book matches yours. Cause like she said, if you use Harry Potter and it's only because they happen to say the word wizard a bunch of times, it's not going to be correct. And it looks like you don't know how to sell or market your own book. So be sure that you know that kind of stuff. Um, I know we did have a question on if you write multiple genres um, or multiple age groups, but you're using the same name. Um, so I can definitely open the floor to that question. Anyone? No, I can go. <laughs> okay, um, so you can totally. It's easier, I know, if you're right, saying writing books and you're also writing romance to have a pen name for one or the other because you want your audience basis to kind of have that footing. It's odd that if you're doing a romance author who cares for picture books that your audience is going to be following you with the same name. So that's usually the case. You really just need to talk to the agent. Um, make sure that they take your genre. Um, if you write nonfiction and fiction, you need to talk to them about it. Cause like say, I don't take nonfiction. You would need to decide if you want an agent who does both or if they're okay with getting a fiction agent and then a nonfiction agent. You just need to have- a I do think, I do think it's much more difficult when you write in multiple genres because it means you have to do two or three times the work because you need to build a reader base in whichever genre you're writing. Um, if you're writing YA and middle grade, it means you need to build a reader base in both of those markets. Um, so if you're prepared to do that, yeah, then definitely write in both. But um, it does take a lot of time to build that. Yeah, yeah so you don't have to come prepared with a pen name. Uh, like Caitlin said, that is something that you discuss with your agent. Even the editor can get involved in that and, and feeling that out. Just be aware that that could be a possibility if you're going in you know, two different directions. And and remember that, like, oh, sorry, Courtney can go first. <laughs> I just want to throw in too, like if you're going to use a pen name, like you don't even, it, you don't need to like kill yourself over trying to find like a pen name or anything. Like um, the first one that comes to mind for me is like Victoria Schwab. She just uses Victoria Schwab for YA and DE Schwab for adult. Like, so you don't have to like use some crazy random name or anything like that. Yeah, and if you write in multi-genres or ages, keep in mind that like, say you get your first deal, most likely you're gonna be writing in that genre and that age group for a bit 
because like they said, you're going to be getting that audience base. So if you sell that first, you may not be working on your other stuff for a little while until you've gained a following that they are sure is either going to follow you or they have worked out a marketing scheme or a way that you can do another genre in that without conflicting or hurting the sales of the other side. So you have to remember that whichever you sell first may be the one that you're going to focus on more long term than the others because that's what's going to get you out there. That's what's going to start getting people loving your work first. So just keep that in mind when you're writing something like what what do you really want to be known for first? Yes, and, and if we could go back to the query letter just for a moment, because I, I we really discussed what should be included in that query letter. And um, I'd like to cover a few things that maybe should not be included in that query letter. So when we've discussed the 200 words, um, you're going to tell us a story, you're going to leave a, a, a cliffhanger, the tone. It's not necessary to really go into detail about why you wrote it. Your family likes it. it and, and I understand that that is super important because it is because you, you're developing your work and you, you want all that support. But that's something that um, just takes away. Like we want you to hit us over the head with that query with your story. So just those extra things. Um, aren't necessary. Um, the only thing I would say you could put in there is if you met me and I said, oh, I would like to read it for sure. Mention that you could say based on, you know, these books that you represent, I think this is a good fit. That's terrific too. But going into too much detail about also the themes of your book and what you want us to take away from it before we read it, like your book is going to stand on its own and speak for itself. So those are a couple things, and I just want to add that in, that you can just totally leave out of, of a query for me. Especially in fiction. Um, you want to make sure you're not giving it all away like that. I always say save those things for the call. If we're really interested in your book, we really love your voice and stuff, when we get on the phone with you, that's when we fall in love with you. That's when we fall in love with the inspiration behind the piece. When we're looking at the query, it's strictly about the book. It's not really about you anymore. That being said, if it's nonfiction or memoir, Keep that in mind that in memory. I think, too, one of the things I think queries is a <laughs> This delay. <laughs> the delay again. I know. Tomorrow I am upgrading my internet. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to talk about themes a bit because themes are very important in your query and your story. And it's important to note those. But don't just note those. We want to know what your story is about first and foremost. Um, and you can you can mention what themes that you do cover because they are the heart of your story. But we need to know what your story ultimately is about. And my cat just jumped and probably will pop into the screen. <laughs> Here she is. Um, it's a lack of cats for me today. Sorry, Courtney, you go ahead. No worries. Um, and I right in front of me. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to add on, um, especially with Ella Marie saying, you know, like with family, like don't tell us your family liked it or anything. Um, I've had fiction queries come in where they have like, their <laughs> partners or random authors, like they give us like little blurbs. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm feeling the show here. Come on now. <laughs> um, but I've had a lot of fiction authors like send me, sometimes it's only like one, sometimes it's like a whole page of um <laughs> of, like, I'm so sorry I'm sorry Courtney I don't know <laughs> your case come on um but just like blurbs from other authors like saying how great their book is and uh I don't know about anybody else but first of all like it shouldn't be there but second of all I have a really obstinate streak in me and when somebody tells me how I should feel about a book it automatically makes me go no <laughs> like, I want to I want to feel how I'm gonna feel about right. the I don't want you to tell me how I'm going to feel about it. Like, it let me just know it. Agreed. Exactly. Um, other things, like, ex especially because Ella brought up personalization, like, that should be, like, if you have it. If you're saying, oh, well, I saw you like fantasy, that's not a personalization. That's something anybody, that is the ice machine, sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, if you have something actually specific that works, or if you want to point out like a specific manuscript wish list post we did on Twitter or something like that. But if you're just saying literally like, oh, I saw you, you, you love fantasy. Well, that's not special. Like, okay. Um, 
I always tell people also, if you have multiple points of views in your book, different voices, say that because if your query makes me think it's like one person and then I get in the book and there's five voices, I'm gonna be really upset for one. But so like if you have two, you have two different characters telling the story, it's a dual POV. If you have multi, say multi POV. So at least I'm warned going forward. You don't have to be like, there are five distinct voices in this. You can, cause that's awesome. But saying multi POV, just so we're aware, um, there's nothing worse than reading a query and then realizing it's not actually from the person we're thinking it is. And, and speaking, going off the multiple POV, also in that query, you should really only be including main characters, like two to three characters. Like don't just put everyone that's in your book and try to cram and you'll see you can't. So that's why we say like around 200 or so words. So it's really going to cut you down and get to the point of the story. So limit the mention the POVs, but limit the characters. Don't put every character that's in your book. You can't do that. Sharon unmuted. Do you want to talk? Yeah. I, yeah. I was going to say, um, if you put in your query um, that one of your comparables is one of my favorite authors, I will jump right on that. <laughs> so if you read um, and have the same favorite authors better. as myself, I'm, what's that? I said, but it better match up. <laughs> it better match up. That's right. Because if, if you tell me Mindy McGinnis is one of your comparables, I'm going to look at that query before any of the other, it better be like Mindy McGinnis. Definitely, definitely true. Um, if you're going to make claims in the book, be sure they come to light, um, that they're actually true. Um, and have beta readers. We were talking about this a lot the other night, is that you need multiple people to look at your query. Um, it can't just be you. It can't just be your mom. It has to be multiple people. And I say mom because, you know, moms can be harsh and blunt as well. So, like, a lot of people tell us, oh, yeah, my mom read it, and she, like, gave me all these pointers and that. So it needs to be more than direct family. Um, because you don't know if they're being biased. You don't know if they're just being nice to you. They may be super blunt and rude. Like I have family members will just tell me how it is, but you need other people. And we also know that like places like Query Shark, where they post examples of queries are perfect for learning what doesn't work, what works. Um, and we talked about a lot. We had some questions about when do you stop querying or when is a good time to query? We had a lot of people wondering about timing with these things. And we actually have a pretty, I feel like we have a good consensus on that, don't we? Anyone? <laughs> that was open. Yeah, I think so. I mean, for me, I think it's a personal. Yeah, um, I jumped right in, except I was on delay. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's a personal thing. Um, you'll know when it's time to stop querying. If you get consistent feedback on your query, you might want to stop for a while and fix that. Um, if you're not getting any interest in your query, um, maybe your query needs to be um, rewritten. Um, if you're getting requests, but then you're getting rejected, you might want to go back and look at your first pages. Yeah. Anybody else want to jump in? Yes, and I think um, uh, a couple other Twitter questions that went along with what Sharon was saying uh, was like the the query is super entertaining and people are really enjoying it, but it does have to, again, tone. It has to match the story that you're putting forward. So if you're getting rejected, but but they really liked your query, then you're, you're going to have to think how that matches up and, and go in, look at your first pages, your first three chapters and see if, if that's what it is. <laughs> um, we're all, we're all in agreement. <laughs> yeah, we're all like, okay, yep, that's exactly what we thought. Um, erring on the side of now, like, when do you stop querying or when is a good time to query? We've, I mean, you can query as long as somebody says they're open to querying. If they say they're not open and you email them, we have query manager, luckily, so we can literally just shut it down. Um, if you email somebody and it says on their profile or it says on their Twitter, you know, not taking submissions right now, you need to respect that and not do it. That being said, like agents have different lives. Agents do different things in different seasons. There's not really a good, bad time to send. Even if you send it to us when we're busy, we're eventually going to get to it. So there's not really a time to the best time to send. 
Now, when you should stop querying is I think basically what Ella and Sharon were touching on there is that if you're getting a lot of no feedback or you're getting just no interest at all, it may be a time to pull the book, reevaluate it, and you should always be writing something else in the meantime anyway. So maybe the market's just not right for that title too. Be sure you have something else to start querying when this book has really gone through the ranks or when you realize it may need to be revised. Have something else because again, we as agents don't want the one trick pony either. We want to be working with you on things. We want to send a lot of your stuff out. So if you just have the one, it's it's almost looks like you have only one thing to put all your eggs in one basket, basically. And and I think something else else that was asked was, you know, I'm I'm sending out, but keep in mind I'm constantly, you know, making my query better, which is is good, but you should not send until you're really sure that it is at its best. That's not saying it could never be improved, but you're running the risk. So it, it's once I've seen something and if I have to pass on it, seeing it two or three more times, even if you've improved it, isn't going to get it through to me because I, I will see I've already passed on it. So you want to really make sure when you send it out that it's ready. Um, and then if you have to pull it back and really think it through and work on it, take the time to do that. Make sure you're like Caitlin said, you know, matching up to the market, um, have done any improvements that you can do, have done the improvements on your, your chapters so that when you do resubmit, you don't want to burn through all the agents you can query before it's ready. All right, any final notes on querying? Anything we missed, you guys? I was just gonna say real quick, it is a very subjective business. So just because one agent or editor does not like your story doesn't mean that another will not. And we see that as well. We have editors that absolutely um, do not like something that we may pitch and another editor may love it. So it is very subjective, so don't get discouraged too early. And research. I mean, we have things that like Courtney loves that I don't love, but I get it. And maybe I'll share it with Courtney or she'll share something with me. I say this because Courtney and I have a lot in common with a lot of our books. Um, but yeah, like research really like closely to make sure you're finding somebody that you think is a match, not somebody that you just like found the name and we're like, oh, I want to query them and just send it. Like, research it. All right. Any last thoughts on queries, everyone? Because now, you know, we're moving to the fun part of the synopsis. I'm going to let everyone else talk first before I, you know, spill all my feelings all over this video. So. <laughs> Caitlin well, has very strong feelings about yeah, synopsis. So. Well, I'll start it off just by saying the, the one thing the synopsis is not is a copy and paste of the query. And, and I get that a lot where the query is just also exactly in the synopsis. And, and that is not what we want. So when I mentioned that the query is to grab our attention, you can have a cliffhanger. You, you want us to read more. You want us to, to see what the story is about. The synopsis is not going to have a cliffhanger. It is going to detail to us what you're going to have in your manuscript so that we can read that synopsis and know what we're in for when we read the story. And the step-by-step -step that goes along with that um, goes far beyond the query. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll let others do the body and then I have further comments at the end. <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, I know like, especially because I've had a couple of clients go and sub recently. And so I've gone over their synopses and I think one of the biggest things I've seen is I, it's kind of the same thing with the query that you kind of like lose the bigger picture, like when you're trying to write your synopsis, um, because I've had to like almost completely rewrite their synopsis synopses. Um, and it's simply because they're not you're not focusing like on the right things. Um, so that might be one as well. If you have like another writer friend who knows your story, it might be helpful to have them look at it as well. Um, not to rewrite it because your critique partners should not be rewriting your synopsis for you, but to like help point out, like if you're not focusing on the right thing and if you're losing the big picture, focusing on little details that don't need to be in your query and your synopsis. Yeah. I think if you look at it from a bigger picture, it's beginning, middle and end. 
if you can cover the main points from the beginning, middle, and end of your story, um, and it doesn't drag out to seven, eight pages, um, three to five pages is probably optimum, um, only covering the important details of your story. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the page count. Um, I want Ella to go first because I'm, I just, I don't want to dominate this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when you begin the synopsis, again, we want to know who the protagonist is. We want to know the inciting incident. We want to know the hurdles they have to overcome. Um, the synopsis, uh, Sharon's talking about the long synopsis, but the synopsis that we would get like in the query um, would not be that long. Eventually you'll have to write that two to three page, but not when you send the original manuscript. Um, and you want to go about two things for me when I read the synopsis and Kaylin's going to get into the specifics. But for me, the protagonist, <laughs> she's just waiting to get into the specifics. The protagonist is the heart of the story. So you cannot forget that part of it. You also want to make them very active and you want to show those actions. You want to show those hurdles. You want to show, show the goal that they have that they're going to obtain and what they have to go, do to get there. Um, sometimes when you map that out, it can feel a bit mechanical, um, but you also have to have that tone of your genre and the heart has to be put in there. So it, what is very good for synopsis for me, it, either if you write it before you write your, your manuscript as an outline, or if you write it after you've written a manuscript, if once you've read that, it sounds like other stories you've read, run of the mill story, if it's dulled down, that is something that you can really work with. Because then you can say, is this story, what is the standout here? If the standout is missing from the synopsis, then you can think, is it missing from the manuscript? Uh, for me, the you know, thriller, suspense, mystery, twist. Are there twists that uh, I did not see coming? If it is not in the synopsis, then it, it, it must not be in your manuscript. And those two things go hand in hand. So that's going to assist you on both. And even though suspense and thriller, it's all about that ending, I still have to know the ending in your synopsis. I know it spoils it, but but you know what? I'm used to it. I'm not spoiling it for all the readers out there. Just me. I can take it. So that's what a, that's what a synopsis is. You have to think of it as a spoiler document. That's what I always call it. It's beginning, middle, you have to include the end. People have fought me so much on this. You have to include the end. Now, some agents don't like to read the end and they won't. Courtney and I are very good friends with somebody who does not read the end of the synopsis because they don't want to read it. Still include it because like if it's me, I want that ending. I need to know if you suddenly say, hey, it's a dream. Something like that, we need to know. Basically the synopsis is beginning, middle and end, then one or two filler lines of how they interconnect. And like Ella said, if it's a thriller or a suspense or something, we should see those little twists and turns. We should see the surprise that comes out that says, hey, fooled you, this actually happens. But like Ella said, Sharon, I made a face at you. Please don't send me a five page synopsis. Um, so some agents like longer ones, some don't. You need to look at the submission guidelines, obviously. One to two pages. If it can fit on one page, single space it. If it doesn't fit on one page, it has to be double spaced. So two pages double spaced is the max you should really go for. Just trust me on this. Just do it. Because we've already read your query. We've most likely read your pages already. And then we go back to the synopsis to see. And if we are already, our eyes are already tired from how many things we've read that day. Two double space pages is all we're really going to want to slog through with that synopsis. We all know you hate the synopsis. We all know you're scared of the synopsis. And we all know you maybe won't be able to put in the voice, may not be able to put in the personality. Just give us the beginning, middle, and end and how they interconnect. That's all we ask for. If you can put voice in it, if you can put personality in it, that is fabulous. It says a lot about you as a writer. 
If you can't, we're not going to reject you. That's just how it is. That's always my spiel at the beginning. I'm not going to go full, full synopsis deep right here because that is not our chat tonight. But I have an article with Writer's Digest. Go look it up. You can see how to maybe do the synopsis. I do a bunch of, I'm going to do a talk in the next few months. So just always look at my Twitter. But just make sure you're giving us the points. And if it's dual timelines, you know, we had a specific question about that. If it's dual timelines, it's a bit tricky. You can do the first timeline on the first page, second timeline on the second page, or you can, my cat's now bothering me. Um, or you can focus on the two characters in both timelines and do paragraph by paragraph and then show at the end how those, those timelines intercede, how they kind of become one or how they have one to do with the other. We need to see why they're side by side, otherwise there's no point. Um, if you have multiple characters though, we get this a lot. I know Sharon's probably gotten like a million times that, oh, well, I have so many main characters, you know, and, you know, I don't have a main one. They're all, hi, they're all really <laughs> as important, but <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, we love our cat. One. Yeah, the cat, the cats rule the day. <laughs> um, there's always one that they is kind of the strongest. <laughs> Um, or that the others congregate around, you know, the story really focuses more on that person than it does the entire cast. Hi. <laughs> Sit. <laughs> um, so there's still one person you can really tell the story from and not give us like five different characters. And just like what Ella said with the query, we shouldn't be getting every single character in your book. Like we shouldn't be getting night number one, night number two in your synopsis. It's gonna be your main character, your secondary main character, or you know the other POV, and maybe like a bit about the antagonist or something like that. If we're seeing a ton of character names, we're immediately going to forget everything. So you've just gotta keep it focused. Um, yeah, I don't wanna go too deep into it because I'll just never stop, but. I was gonna go back into the parallel, <laughs> if you have parallel timelines. Yeah. Um, they need to be woven together. You cannot have two parallel timelines that do not, not end up woven together at the end. And I see a lot of that. Two storylines that never come together. They need to come together. Yeah, otherwise, why do you have them? Like, there has to be something linking the two. Um, I just want to throw in really quick, um, if you're looking for example, like Caitlin said, with the multi uh, points of views with lots of characters who are like main characters, a good one to look at is uh, Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. Um, because that one, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I think of Kaz, like when I think of that book, like, um, and so that might be one to like, look at like what it, the synopsis actually looks like for that book, for a book that has like many points of view and many main characters, if you're looking for an example. Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. Did did the uh, oh god, I, uh, Sarah? Can't remember her name. Truth Witch. Didn't she post her synopsis somewhere? Maybe. Look, Maybe look, that sounds right. I I don't know. Maybe look that up because I know I know she did a really. She's very. She has a lot of clarity on a lot of her writing process. So maybe look her up as well. Um, but yeah, that's a really good title to look at and be like, there's a clear, definitive, strong character. The story kind of revolves around. Um, oh, one more thing. I wanted to point out what Ella said actually about how you need to show the character moving the story forward where the character has agency and it's not just everything happening around them that forces them to do things. The character is actively moving their own story. So if you're writing a synopsis and you're literally saying, well, this happens to the character. So he runs away from home and then gets kidnapped and is forced to go to this place and then forced to go to this place. And then somebody apprentices him against his, it's all happening to the character. The character's not like actively doing anything. It's he's being pushed around by fate basically. So be sure, like Ella said, you need to show the character has agency and is kind of an active person otherwise it's very boring we can tell the story is going to be boring from that because it's we don't care about the character because they're not actively taking hold of things if that makes sense and and high stakes uh in one way or another i mean there has to be something you know to overcome while they're on that journey 
Yeah, and it it doesn't have to be life or death. So um, I'm into YA and high stakes for a young adult could be something like losing their friend. So as long as the stakes are high for that character, but you need to have them. Exactly. Got to show what makes that story interesting. Otherwise, why are we reading it? We're going to ask, why should we care about that character's journey? That's really the main thing. All right. So moving on from the synopsis, I can put it out of my head. So we're going to go to pages now because we had some specific questions on, you know, our process when we request partials and fulls, you know, do we actually read them? Do we skim them? When do we stop? So um, let's start with Courtney for this one and just kind of go through our process doing stuff like this. Okay, so yeah, so I know for me, um, I always read the query. I always read at least a little bit of the of the pages that you sent me, no matter what. Um, but when it comes to pages, um, I know that I tend to stop, I think, sooner than most people do, like with their first pages. Like if I read a couple paragraphs and I'm not vibing with it, I usually don't request it because voice is something that like I have to click with to like love a manuscript. Um, if I request like a partial or a full, um, I tend to request partials more often because I always feel guilty if I request a full and I don't read the whole thing. Um, but it's usually just a matter of if I feel like I don't want to read anymore, that's usually where I stop. There's not a hard and fast rule, for, I think, for most people um, when they're reading. Um, yeah, just that. I, if I do request like a partial, I do try to read the whole thing just in case. But yeah, if I have your full and I get like halfway through and I'm like, like, I don't really want to keep going. I'm not going to keep going at that point. So, yeah. I agree. And each each uh, agent does their own thing. They want they will follow the guidelines. They'll tell you what they want. Um, I always take the first three chapters and. I begin reading every query. I, I read pages um, and it just depends where I stop. If, if something stops me, like Courtney said, if I'm not connecting and that's kind of goes with what Sharon said, it also your, your personal preferences do come in. So if I'm not just connecting and I have to pass, um, that doesn't mean it isn't for another agent, but I always request, three because I that that third chapter um, for mystery thriller suspense is where you know the something has to occur and happen and I want to see you know what's happening so that's what I do um, and then I'll request the full uh, based on that um, I personally I will read the query if it is um, an extremely interesting concept. I'll read the first page. Um, if the voice grabs me, but I'm not liking what I see in the first page, I will skim ahead because what I find most times is we get a lot of authors who their story starts um, usually chapter three or four. So if I love the concept and I love the voice, I will jump ahead to chapter three um, to see if there is a better start there if it's not we usually pass yeah so I feel like a lot of us are very similar in that if the voice isn't there we're usually going to stop reading just because voice for us is a very big selling factor <laughs> move your butt um for us like we know if it's something even if you have a good voice if we're not clicking with it that's a factor it means that we're not going to love it as much as we want to and maybe that'll affect our ability to sell it um, I know I only ask for the first five pages because I can, from that first five pages, f figure out your voice, your writing style, if you know grammar and usage, um, and if you know punctuation and stuff like that. Um, because for me, if you're a heavy need of line editing, you're not ready to be querying. So there's a lot you can tell from that. We get a lot of people telling us, you know, how can you tell from the first chapter or first five pages? You know, it gets really good after that. Well, then why aren't you starting where it gets really good? Why are you starting with something that isn't your best work? So you always need to think about that. Um, and you have to remember too that if we start reading it and we love it, if it's a contest, sometimes we'll do the full because we know, hey, maybe somebody else is going to read the full before me and offer before me. If it's not, I usually do 50 pages first just because we have such big reading lists that 
I don't have time to have 20 fulls in my box. I need maybe 10, 13, 50 pages and maybe six fulls and then hopefully get back to you in three months. Like you have to remember how many we read. So it's going to be very subjective on it. And some of us will skim it and some of us will go full. I like what Sharon said where I do this with the, the sorry, she's distracting me. Um, I do this when I request partials and fulls is that if the first chapter is not great, I will skip a little bit ahead and see if maybe, oh, your second and third chapter is actually where you should have started the book. And now you get really good because then in my head I can be like, I know how to edit this. But, you know, with that first five pages, you really need to be trying to put your best foot forward. Um, so for us, I think it's all about voice and making sure you actually know the kind of thing you're writing. Anything else you guys want to add on pages? Now I'm good. <laughs> All right. Next questions we had were about basically market, where the market is right now, what's in, what's out, what we think anyway, and how you handle things when your topic maybe is oversaturated at the moment or is not what the market's looking for right now. So why don't we go ahead and start with Ella? Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So that, that, that's a common question because um, right now, you know, a lot of writers are, are, are writing really good stories that might be dystopian or might be urban fantasy. And right now the market is a bit flat on that. Um, and my advice is if you have like a really outstanding, unique standout character, standout story something that's not out there that hasn't been seen i think you could go ahead and query uh and then you know the agent should help you on your way in those decision making you know is this something that should be held is this something we should go forward um and and that's the best way to do it uh i do believe that if the market is flat and something and you know because you should be researching and seeing you know what's out there and what's not you should continually be writing. So if you're querying something and it's a bit flat, start something else, you know, start, start a new project, get going on that. And if, if the query isn't going the way you hoped and you don't have an agent to interact with and, and figure out the market, then pick up that next thing and, and, and move forward is what I would suggest. Um, I'll jump in. Um, you know what Ellen Marie said, like if you have something in your back pocket that you have to work on, that's maybe more marketable than something else. Like definitely think about working on that. If you have something that you're like burning to write, or you have like a heart story that you need to get down on the page, like write what you want to write. Um, I also just wanted to say like the market can change like that. Like everybody's guessing, everybody is trying to predict like what it will be like. Um, so even agents, even editors, I don't know exactly like what the market's going to be, um, because everybody's just taking a guess at what's going to sell. Um, so even if you are writing something that is maybe not selling super hot right now, um, that could change in a heartbeat. So if you do have something that you're super passionate about, definitely still query it. You never know. Um, and also I just wanted to add to that. If you're only looking at books that are coming out, like right this second, you're a couple few years like behind what's going to what's selling actually right now to editors. Um, so if you're able to like look at either books that are coming out in a couple years, or if you are able to look at things like Publishers Marketplace and actually see what editors are picking up like right this second, um, which you don't have to look at like you don't have to have Publishers Marketplace because I know it costs money and like some people can't do that and that's totally fine. But <laughs> if you are able to, it's a good source of looking at what editors are picking up like right this second. I'm done. All right, I will add, do not follow trends. So just because something is selling well today, does I, it, it takes two years to get your book published. So just because something is selling well today does not mean in two years going to selling well. Um, 
just make sure if you are writing something in a genre that is dead, and I don't believe any genres are ever dead, um, just make sure you have a unique twist on it. We took an urban fantasy and we know that market is slow and it's selling very, very well. Um, so if you do want to write vampires and werewolves and urban fantasy, that's fine. Just look for something that makes it stand out. Exactly. Um, it's really about what makes your story unique. Um, and I love that you say don't write to trend just because, say, what's on trend right now? We're in a pandemic. Don't submit a pandemic book right now. Wait a year or so, maybe six months. Wait till, you know, this hotspot's out. Because right now it's too realistic. It's too on the nose. The same thing with when the presidential elections happened and people were swarming our inboxes with stories about presidential elections, government, corruption, like all that stuff. It's, it's too close to true right now. You've got to gauge what's going on. Now, next year, will pandemic things be on the rise? Maybe. You don't know. We could be out of it and we could be interested in now examining what happened. But right now, maybe don't mirror society because that would be writing to trend. And like Courtney said, there are some free resources where you can keep up with what's being published in the next two years, like what just got announced. Um, Twitter is great because we announce all of our sales a lot because we're freaking excited. Um, so we will post a lot of that stuff. Look at manuscript wish list all the time because it's going to tell you what people are looking ahead to do. It's really hard to determine the market because you're basically predicting the future. But like say when the last Marvel movie came out, no, nothing's going to top the last Marvel movie as it was coming out. So superheroes were on the decline. The boys came out then. Superheroes with a new twist. Hmm, maybe that's something that's going to be selling soon. Now we're seeing a thousand superhero movies or books being, if you looked at the last TV pit and all that stuff, there's a ton of superhero things. We don't know what the market's going to play with now because we're in that in-between phase. You've just got to kind of figure out what you want to write, what you love, and see what's going on in the industry. At the end of the day, like Courtney said, though, write what you love. Like... Yeah, and I can add to that. There's many. I was just going to say, I can add to that, too, that there is many editors telling us they do not want pandemic right now. So fiction or nonfiction, they don't want to see it. They don't, um, especially not if it's like specific, like contemporary. There's some viral thing or the, the government created a virus or something and it got out like those things right now are just not happening right now. Again, six months down the line, maybe that'll change. But please don't send it to us right now. Um, now, if it's a very, very different thing, like a fantasy twist on it, I can't say. I know we I have, I have a client right now who has a slightly sort of thing like that, and we're getting a lot of interest. So take things with a grain of salt. And that's why you need beta readers, too. You need multiple readers to kind of gauge, and they're like, why? Are, I don't, I don't, I don't, this, this doesn't hurt. It hurts to read, or it... You know, it mirrors life to right now too much. And so your beta readers are going to give you good feedback on that. Um, and again, what we didn't touch on that I think we've all agreed on multiple times is that you don't ever have to throw something away. Even if maybe it's not the time for it right now, you can shelve it. And when you notice the market's leaning towards something again, bring it back out. We do that with our clients where maybe it's not getting hit. They have another title that sounds more promising. But when we're talking to editors, we'll pitch all the works and they may grab the one that's on the shelf right now. So don't feel like you have to get rid of something and you're like giving up your dream book like you never go back to it. That's not the case ever in writing. You can definitely bring it back out and like dust it off and have a brand new, totally sellable book. Um, I think our last topic was going to be about hybrid books, kind of what, how hybrid authors kind of can figure out their areas to send to how we think it's best to get noticed or get agents with these kinds of books and stuff like that. So why don't we start with Sharon on this one? I think that's a hard one. Hybrid books are very hard to sell because there is not a defined market um, or reader base. Um, however, it does not mean you should not pursue them. Um, there are some very successful hybrid books on the market. Um, So definitely, again, just make it sure it's something that is unique, um, something that's different. And, 
you know, then you have a chance. I mean, anything, if you can bring a different concept to the market, you always have a chance. Anybody else want to jump in? I'll go. Um, I mean, I know for like me sometimes too, it's helpful to like look at kind of like what the base of your story is. So like if you have something that's based in like a kind of sci-fi setting, but you have like a hybrid twist with it, um, it can be helpful to like pitch it as this is a sci-fi with blah, 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 like elements to it so that you can you can still place it like within a genre, but also letting the agent or editor, whoever you're pitching to, know that there is going to be like a hybrid element to it. So they're not taken by surprise when you open the pages because it's very disorienting to open pages and go, wait, this is not <laughs> what I thought it was gonna be. So yeah. Right, and I agree with that. And if it, the only thing I can add to it is if it is a hybrid, again, make sure you're querying the proper agent like Courtney said, that the main part of that is going to fit with that agent and then tell them that it's a hybrid also. So they're going to get a little bit of unexpected. So, um, you know, it's got to have that, you know, adult mystery, thriller, suspense, historical element to come to me. So if it's a hybrid of two totally different things that I can't, you know, attach to, then it won't work. So make sure that that base is going to, you know, grab the right editor. Yeah. Just remember what's the root of your story, because people send sci science fantasy to us, which isn't a real thing, or um, sci-fi romance, which isn't a real thing. You need to look at your genre and realize what those actually are. You probably have a science fiction with a romantic subplot or romance elements. Like, think of it in that way. You need to find the genre that's the root of the story, the heart of the story. And a great way to do it is to go to indie presses or go to digital only sales because they're usually very specific on how they're selling it because, like we said, it's a hard sell. So a lot of the houses that do that, they're going, see how they're selling it. See how they're listing it in the industry, like on Publishers Marketplace. How did they put that pitch out there? How did they label it? Because they're not going to be saying this is a science fantasy. They're going to be saying it's like, a fantasy with tech world building or something like that. See how they did it. That can help you structure it. Um, and Ella's right. You need to find somebody who actually does that. Like you're not going to send me something that's sci-fi, heavy sci-fi with like a bit of romance because I don't want heavy sci-fi. Even if it is a, a hybrid thing, that's not for me. And I specifically say that in a lot of my miniature wish lists. So again, look at the wish list, look at the pitches, look at the evergreen tweet, look at the submission guidelines, see what we actually want, and then see the elements of your book. Because hybrids are fantastic books. Indie publishers love them. Bigger houses love them on occasion. Right now, remember, everything's in flux. Editors don't know what's going on. Agents don't know what's going on because the world doesn't know what's going on. So we're just hunting for great books and we're selling them to people who just want them. So look at what other people are pitching, look at how they're wording that so you can figure out the elements of your story. Yeah. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> like, I don't know how to end that statement. Yeah, no, I was just gonna add to that. You'll need, you know, just make sure you have patience because they take longer to sell. Um, and, because the big five, you know, they they want to ensure that there is established reader base for your novel. And sometimes a hybrid, you may have to go with an independent publisher because they're willing to take that risk. But they love their staff. I love all of our publishers. <laughs> People are always like, oh, I don't want to go to a digital only press. Like, I want to do blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you may you need to rethink like think of what your career path is in that but some books really do better digital only because they can sell really mm -hmm. well just because you're digital only doesn't mean you have right. like a platform or less of an earning income kind of thing so again don't be snobby about it hybrid does very well with indie publishers and, mm -hmm. and digital only sales they make good money with that like people love them and it's a lot more accessible to some areas if it's digital only or something like that there are some places in the U.S., you know, getting a physical copy is either Absolutely. or not realistic. So don't turn your no nose up at it, especially if you're a hybrid author, because those are very good open opportunities for you. And for everybody. Absolutely. 
So I think those are most of our like main questions that we got that we thought could really benefit the wider audience. Um, do you guys have anything to add to the chat right now? Um, I was just going to say one <laughs> final word is make sure you know your genre before you pitch. It's a pet synopsis or a pet peeve of Caitlin's. Not knowing your genre is a pet peeve of mine. Um, read widely in your genre. No, make sure you know what you are writing. It makes a big difference. Okay, and that's all I have to say. Well, if we're done with, with all the, the tweets, I want to thank everyone that participated and that uh, replied with those tweets and gave us these questions um, to answer. And I hope we did a good job for you. And I, I hope you're enjoying the videos. And we want to keep that interaction with writers and offer as much as we can, especially everyone, most people at home right now, we want to give you as, as many resources as we can. Um, and when the video is posted, I, I believe Caitlin said you can also comment on that so we can get more feedback and we'd love to keep doing them. Yep. If you guys think of anything we missed or anything you want to know more about, you can go ahead and just put it down in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe so you can see all of our new stuff coming out. Um, and we will either answer in the questions or we will do it in the next webinar. Um, Feel free to reach out to Bell Castro on Twitter and everything like that. We love hearing from new people and finding new things to talk about. So I think we are done for tonight. So thanks for tuning in and we will see you guys soon. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thanks. <laughs>